So welcome to Santa Julia, French Accorta, Brescia, EWBC 2011. Um, wow, I can't believe we got here. Kind of impressive. So yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, cool. um, this year's theme, anybody doesn't know, it's storytelling. Um, the basic, if you, if you go online today and you type in storytelling, it's probably the biggest catchphrase, everybody's talking about it, um, been happening for a long time online in the social media circles. We've been talking about it since we started the conference, and this year we thought <clears throat> this would be a great place to do it, um, really to take and explore the idea that storytelling is different than reporting. And at least as a blogger who's been doing this for six or seven years, um, it feels like there's a lot of people who are simply um, repeating back what they see. And sometimes that's very good, and sometimes that's important, and that's a, a valid way of communicating. But the idea of taking a story and creating a beginning, a middle, and an end to illustrate a point or to um, express an emotion or whatever, we thought was very important. And so we went and we looked for some people we knew, some people we didn't know, who could come here and show us different facets of storytelling. Uh, what we're going to do right now is we have four people who've actually pretty much done it all, but um, they all are going to take one discipline, video, photo, oral, speak, or spoken word, and written, and talk a little bit about what that means to them, and then we'll have them talk to each other a little bit. I encourage you all to interrupt. We'll get a microphone into Robert. Do we have that one? Good. Um, so we'll have a microphone for anybody who wants to ask a question. But let's do an introduction of the four people first, and then, and then we can get into the debate a little bit. So who's starting off? I believe we have. Let's find out. Ah, yes, Jeremy. So Jeremy Parson of Dio Bianchi. Um, he is a writer, a academic, and many other things. I'll let you introduce yourself. And then a guitar player, yes, he is. A, we didn't do the music. We should have. All right, well, you can fit music in. So please, tell us why the written word is so important and who you are. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much to uh, Ryan and Gabriella and Robert. Uh, just what a fantastic job they've done. Come on, you can clap louder than that, people. Um, uh, if you don't know me, I, I author a blog called Do Bianchi. I'm a wine writer, journalist, I'm a musician. I live in Texas. Uh, people know me as the wine blogger who's most in love with a woman uh, named Tracy. And uh, uh, a couple people have you seen pictures of her. Anyway, that's a little bit about me. I live in Texas. I, I moved there to be with Tracy, and uh, we drink wine. So, uh, you know, when, they, when uh, Ryan said, we want you to talk about the written word, that's probably the toughest one, because uh, wine blogging really starts with writing. I mean, there's all these other media that we use, but writing is where it all begins, right? So I have a question for you. How many of you guys are wine bloggers out there? Almost everybody, right? So uh, I want to try and say something interesting about, about uh, the, the written word. How many of you have ever used an at symbol? Anybody? <laughs> a couple of people, right? How many of you ever used uh, uh, italics in, in, in blogging? The reason why I'm talking about these two um, elements, you know, we're in Brescia. We are in, uh, at one point, Brescia was part of uh, the uh, Republic of Venice. And both the at symbol and uh, cursive italic writing were developed in Venice uh, with the advent of the printing press. Is anybody here, where's uh, Lizzie back there? Uh, has anybody ever here heard of Aldus Minutius? Aldo Minutio. One person, a couple people. He was one of the great Venetian printers. He developed cursive writing. And the reason why he developed cursive writing was because he was trying to create a continuity with the handwritten books that came before him. Um, he developed a small format of, of books called Octavo, okay, which in a way was the first pocket-sized book. And it was the first type of book that you could take with you on a trip or you could put in your pocket. Okay. Uh, 
when people saw these books, they complained that they didn't look like the writing in the books didn't look like the writing of the books they used to buy because books used to be handwritten. Okay, so what did Aldo Manutius, Aldous Manutius do? He created the, what we call the italic uh, uh, script, uh, 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 in, in Italian called the cursive script, because he wanted not to use it in the way that we use it today, as today we use it for emphasis or some type of, you know, we're trying to highlight something that we're writing, set it apart from what, what else we write. He used it as a form of continuity with uh, 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 the writing that had come, with, with, with media that had come before. And what I want to propose to you today, and I hope you guys will, you know, ask questions about it and we can talk about it in, in, in our panel today, is that what's so important about the written word in when we blog today is that it gives us continuity with what came before us and it gives us continuity with what will come after us. In other words, if we were to, you know, I have my colleagues here, we're going to talk about photography, about oral tradition, about video uh, media. If we abandon the written word, we'll lose continuity with all that which that came before us and all that which will come after us. And then we'll also, you know, everybody in this room is a wine blogger, everybody enjoys wine, but think about one of the things that wine uh, 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 blogging has changed in, our, in, the, in the wine world today is that all of a sudden you've got, you know, my mother reads about wine today through blogging. You know, my mother would have never, and all of a sudden she has this new interest in wine. Uh, one of the greatest things about the enoblogosphere, as I call it, is that it's brought a whole new world into contact with wine. You know, you see lawyers and doctors and accountants who all of a sudden, because of the entertainment value of wine blogging, are coming into contact with wines that we all know and love, but they wouldn't otherwise have any, any contact with. And if we abandon if I'm here to defend the written word, I'm, I'm here to tell you that if we were to abandon the written word, we would essentially cut away a whole swathe of, of, of readership that wouldn't get to know about uh, all, all these fantastic wines. So I know my time's limited and I want to keep it short, but that's, that's my pitch to you today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I can't wait to get back into that and hear more of the history. What, just quickly, what is your history? You are, what's your degree in? I, I have a doctorate in Italian, and I, and I actually, there's a chapter in my dissertation about Aldous Manutius. So he's the, he's the professional language ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, next up, we're going to jump to video with Paolo, and um, I'm gonna let this play in the background. We don't have any sound for it, but, uh, Paolo, you are probably the newest medium, Emily being photos, uh, the medium of video is so relatively new in this world, and you've been doing some interesting things showing historic elements of uh, Italy. So, why is video important? Yeah, hi everybody, my name is Paolo, so first of all, I'm the only Italian here at this table, so sorry for my English, because as Ryan said, we have problem in taking the bus, but also in speaking a, a good English, so I will try. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a video maker in the sense that uh, I personally film, shoot, and uh, also edit and produce my, my video. Um, first thing I would like to say is that uh, um, I, would like, I would tell not to consider this media as separate things. So personally, when I make a video, when I make a film, I start with writing something, so um, I'm here to defend video, but I also want to say that uh, these media go all together, and particularly in this uh, age of the internet, of YouTube and so on, uh, you as bloggers have to mix all this uh, kind of media. Um, so what about video? Uh, surely it is the most uh, modern uh, of, uh, of the arts, it is the, the latest art. Um, I think uh, um, I would like to, to tell you two concepts, two reasons for which I think video is a, a better way to narrate an history. Uh, the first one is that video is very simple. Uh, I mean it is simple to do because uh, you, 
you could think, uh, no, it's not so simple, but I can tell you, try to write an entire book and then tell me if it's better to, <laughs> to do a, a small clip or to write an entire book. So uh, it is quite simple to do, and most of all, it is uh, simple to, to be watched, to be understood. Uh, this, for me, is the best quality of video. Um, in a certain sense, it is also a limit of video, because uh, uh, everybody knows that uh, if you have a book of 200, 300 pages, from this book derives, uh, derives a video of uh, 90 minutes, so there's a, a sort of reduction. Video is like a summary. Uh, this is in the essence of video. Uh, but uh, this is also an advantage in terms of uh, uh, comprehension, of uh, ability to, uh, to make everybody understand what you say. So the, the first reason is uh, this one, video is simple. Uh, video is simple also because we are now used to YouTube, to sites like YouTube where uh, everyone uploads little clips. So uh, we have passed from uh, uh, movies made by um, well-known uh, uh, directors to movies made by uh, everyone. So um, the, the new idea of video is something very simple, essential, and also easy to do and to produce. Uh, the, the second thing I'd like to say about video is that uh, in, this, uh, uh, in a simple clip you can say very complex things, you can say very complex and difficult uh, arguments, concepts. So I think uh, the, the, the main reason for which video is a good language to narrate a story is that it's a good mix, I don't know if it's perfect, but it's a good mix uh, of uh, simplicity and complexity. So you can tell, you can narrate uh, things that uh, nobody knows. For example, in, uh, in this work, uh, I'm I talking about a little region in Italy that uh, mm, a few people know. Uh, but the video uh, helps me to narrate uh, these stories in a simple way and also to put some uh, difficult uh, arguments, concepts uh, in the movie. And I think that uh, mm, most of the, the, the audience uh, can, um, can understand it without problems. So uh, this is for me the first things I would like to say. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so moving on quickly so we get into the debate. Emily Troutman, our photographer. For me, I I'm too love taking photos. But when they say a photo is worth a thousand words, um, sometimes I see the photos are more snapshots than they are stories. And how do you bridge and, and how, what, what's the difference between a shap, snapshot of something and a, and a story um, in an image? So tell us a little bit about photography. You've been doing a lot of it recently. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm Emily Troutman. And for the past year and a half, I was working in Haiti. Uh, photographing people and places since the earthquake, um, before that working abroad. But last night, Ryan asked a question, and this is the question of our conference. He asked, what is the story of this room? It was the BYOB party, and I was considering that question myself. How do you tell the story of this room? In a way that is different and unique, and I became a little bit obsessed with your hands and the way in which you hold your wine glasses. Because for me, the, uh, the power that photography has is to tell the story that, that you're not saying out loud, right? To speak to what can be said without language. Is it a story of romance? Is it a story of relationships? Or is it just a story of wine? We don't know, but with the photo, we can start to decide what the real story is. So I'd like you all to do me a favor and put down your cameras. <laughs> I know, I know, put down your cameras, I just said it, put them down. Put down your cameras for just a second. I want you to just close, close one eye and, and then put, put your, your hand up to your eye like this. And, and look around the room. And consider what is the story of this room? Is it uh, these amazing murals? Is it the speakers? Is it this really interesting intersection between the screen and uh, a really ancient room? Is it the corners where we have all these plugs where certainly there weren't in previous times? 
the power behind photography is, um, is also within its limitations. I'm a writer as well, and my work um, as an international journalist has also been in writing. What photography has provided me is the opportunity to work within a very set uh, uh, limit. So within a photo, we have a frame. We have four corners. We have to speak within those four corners. I don't get to go on for 900 words or 1,000 words or 5,000 words. I only get this four by six frame. Uh, the other limitation is, of course, that this frame doesn't speak to everything. As you turn your head and look through the room, you can see that you're almost turning a corner every time you turn. There are so many stories in this room and so many different ways to tell it. Uh, the other limitation, of course, that photography has is that I don't get to speak out loud. Um, but it's also, I would say, part of the power of photography that, that the other mediums don't have, is that I get to pretend to be invisible. And that's a, little bit of a, that's a little bit of a trick, right? Because we know, of course, that different photographers do have voices, they have styles. But for me, I get to pretend that I'm not there, and that what you're seeing is the truth. Right? We use photos as evidence often. So I get to pretend that this is the truest story here in this photo, um, an intimate moment where someone's holding their own wine glass. Um, here, more conversation. Or maybe this is uh, a networking event. We don't know. So I get to uh, present truth as I see it, and I get to pretend that, that I had no hand in it, right? But you know that when you look around the room, you have a lot of autonomy in that space. Um, so I, I think as a writer, it's, um, it's always difficult to, to say that photography is something, or writing is something, and that's a, a little bit of a falsehood to decide what something is. But these three things, um, to work within a frame, to be invisible, to uh, speak without words, have a lot of power in them. And when you combine just a few images of, of what you decide are truth, you can tell any kind of story you want and also allow lots of different kinds of people to interpret it, move within it, without imposing yourself on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Finally, we're going to finish before we move on to questions and, and the debate part with Evan, who is an author. He recently published a book, Summer by the Glass. In a, by the glass? In the glass? In a glass. All right. It's close. Messed that one up. Um, and, uh, but you have found that you do a lot of speaking now that you're a writer. And so we want to hear... It, kind of the irony of it is we're all defending our medium in your medium, <laughs> the spoken word. So um, we'll pass this down and you can talk. Only because, uh, only because uh, I can't see the back of the room sitting down. I just wanted to stand up for a second. So. Um, I was sitting in the passenger seat of a Fiat, and I only knew two things. I knew that my wife and I were about to die, and I knew it was the stupidest way you could figure out how to die. We were late. We were going to Buon Convento for our first day trying to immerse ourselves in Tuscany, going to Montalcino, meeting with makers of Brunello. And in that little Fiat, we were about to crash off the side of an Italian road. Now, you know Italian roads, and we know the hairpin curves. And if you've been to Tuscany or Piemonte, see? Outrageous. Much more difficult are Americans driving a Fiat for the first time. Only one of the Americans knows how to drive a stick shift, and it is not me. And the other American has not driven a stick shift since she was 16. And we're late. We're late for dinner, we're late to our agriturismo. And we turned up, don't follow a GPS in Italia. We've learned that, anybody learned that this week? Just here in town. So we'll turn up this side road, thinking we're finally there in Buon Convento, and it is the wrong turn, and we know this going up, it is just essentially one lane, 
and there are steep drop-offs on all sides, an olive grove. We're about to die in an olive grove, and here's why we're about to die. My wife could not figure out how to put the car in reverse. And we realized we needed to turn around. Ask yourself how you're going to turn around on a road that snakes up a hillside like this and falls off on all sides. It's about one lane long. So I said to her, we're in a little trouble here. And she looked at me and she said, no shit, do you want to drive? <laughs> we found the widest part of the road we could find. This is, she's laughing because it's true. She turns the car just enough that I'm telling you the front wheel is over the edge of an olive grove. And I'm looking down thinking, no one will find our body. And if they do, they will laugh. And we somehow edged that car backwards, got it down the hill. We found our agriturisma. Now our host that night explained that on a Fiat, there's just a tiny little switch to make the damn thing go in reverse. It was not that complicated. We'd never seen it. They laughed. Now we learned how to do something different. And we, it almost killed us. I talk to writers all the time who say, I don't speak in front of crowds. And I say, you need to learn how to do something a little different because you think it doesn't matter. Let me tell you, as a writer this year, my first book was out this year in April. I want to, you to think about your blog and your writing as your resume. It's your body of work. And we talk about blogging. Not everybody here is a blogger. There are people who work in the industry, etc. But you write. That's your body of work. So that's your resume. Your oral presentation is your job interview. And for many of you, like me, you'd like to work in the industry. Maybe you want to be a professional writer. Anybody want to be a professional writer here? Anybody who is not a professional writer who writes a blog would like to be a professional writer? Maybe a few, yeah. Uh, industry professionals as well. Many people in marketing and communications. You're already working in the industry. You're going to continue working in the industry. So when you think about your oral presentation, think about it as your job interview because someday you may need to stand up and tell a story and talk to an employer. But I want you to think also about something in a different way. No matter what way you write, if you do it well, you're going to have an opportunity to speak to people in person. My book came out. I got a call from the New York Times. They wanted to talk about it on the phone. One of the first questions, tell me what the book is about. All of a sudden, instead of writing, which I've been relying on, I need to speak, and I need to find a way to articulate this in a compelling way. Why is this a job interview? Because if I bore the heck out of the New York Times, I'm fired. They, they fire me as a compelling story. If I do it well, they hire me, and they write a story. So if you, do, if you write your, your blog well, if you write communications well, if you market well, that's not where it stops. This is the component in, in blog writing and in presentations that so many great storytellers lack, that so many people think that I can write or I can, I mean, look at this panel here. Do you know how difficult it is for me to follow this? Everyone knows that Paolo would look sexy eating a sandwich. You're not easy to follow. He's also, there's no way you can argue the importance of video storytelling. I've already seen some of your work. It's magnificent and you tell the story so well. Jeremy Parson, if you don't read Dobianki, is one of the great blogs because he tells stories in his posts. He makes you feel like you're sitting there in Tuscany. It's, it's wonderful. Emily, I was, cap I was captivated just watching your pictures there, just seeing the way you told the story of last night. I thought that's brilliant. So coming here to tell you that oral presenting is somehow more important, Ryan wants to pit us against each other, that's like coming to Europe and saying basketball is the best sport. We all know it's bullshit. But I will tell you that this can change the way you write and it can make you a more effective storyteller. I'll make one last point and I'll shut up. I would simply say this. I had a wonderful conversation with Wink Lortz last night. Hi, Wink. I was reminded of something important. The future of great storytelling, especially in the wine world, I think is specialization. Now, in America, we have a lot of bloggers who are sort of general bloggers. They think they're going to be the next decanter, and they're not, and they find a way to convince wineries to send them samples. They don't really have an audience, and that's not going to last. In, here in Europe, there's a lot of specialization already. I think it's wonderful. I mean, you're looking at people in this room who specialize. I can see it all around me. If I want to know about the Jura, where do I go? Wink, Brett, I can sit here and learn all I know. You're looking around the room, Wink, but your stuff is wonderful, and it is specialized, and it's brilliant. Greg Del Piaz, I could listen to you talk about Piemonte for the rest of my life.
It's wonderful. It's truly special stuff because the specialization is important. That's the future of great writing, but there are two tracks to specialization. One, as Wink pointed out last night, if you become so specialized, you can lose the context of the world around you. I would never come from the Finger Lakes and tell you that even though the Riesling is great, I have no idea how it relate, relates to Mosul or Austria or Australia or Alsace or so many other places. Context is essential in specialization. And then the other trap is you get up to tell a story, but you think, I know everything about the Jura Wink. I, I know the soils. I know the yields. I know every name. And what you forget is you're there to tell a story and to get people plugged into what you're saying. And you don't need to be an expert on everything in that moment. In oral presenting, storytelling is about actually distilling it to something really meaningful and valuable and interesting. And you don't have to show off and be the expert. You don't have to spit facts and figures out just to prove it to your audience. They'll feel it when you're telling the story. So I would tell you that specialization may be the future, but you don't have to crash off into that olive grove. You can find a way to figure out where the damn reverse button is and do something a little different. It has worked pretty well for me, and when you have a chance to take your blog writing and be interviewed for the radio, when someone calls from a radio interview, they need a specialist, they've read your blog, they want to talk to you. That is an oral presentation. You write a book, you need to stand up in front of an audience, that is an oral presentation. You have a chance to talk to a television news site that wants to know more about what you're doing. Online, EWBC, oral presentation is not just what I'm doing right now. It's so much more than that, and I think that there's a lot of value there. And so I hope I've at least brought a little value to this forum, but I'm sure we'll talk some more. So thank you very much. That's a hard one to follow. That's a, that's a tough one to follow there. Um, yeah. So uh, a couple things come up. First of all, uh, when you say this is your moment, this is your storytelling, the one you didn't say, which I think gets overlooked a lot, is the cocktail party. <laughs> Talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody, that's oral presentation. You know, and that happens so much in our world. And I think people feel, I'll just be myself. I don't need to communicate well in these intimate situations. It's only when I'm on stage I have to be refined. And sometimes it's nice to, to take that into consideration. But I did want to throw one thing out that you brought up, which really struck me when you said it, was identity. And the way you, I never thought of it, but really the photographer doesn't have to be a part of the photo. It really can be anonymous. It can be harder, I guess, in video. And writing is probably the hardest. But what role is, does identity play in the various disciplines? If you want to expand a little bit on what you're saying. Well, I, I think, I guess I made my point earlier, but I, I think photography for me, um, the, the idea is to, uh, to become uh, less obvious in the moment so I can capture a story as I see it without um, overwhelming you with me. Um, and as a writer, I, fe I feel like that's more difficult. The words convey a lot about me. Um, that through a photo they don't necessarily. With a photo I can just um, you know, show instead of tell, literally. Um, you know, writing teachers are always saying that, but with a photo it's, it's really easy. <laughs> but maybe you guys want to say something about identity. Yeah, well, I mean, Paulo, I mean, in a, when you're filming, you have, you, how do you make yourself not become part of the story? Because a camera could be quite scary. I know it's scary when Carrie sticks the camera in my face. <laughs> It's uh, not possible, theoretically, not to enter in the story. I mean, uh, when I press record, the people that sit in front of me start to think about what they, they have to say. So uh, it's not possible, really, to, to be out of the story. You are, you are always involved. Uh, you always express your point of view. So uh, there are many types of uh, documentaries. I do documentary movies. Uh, I think you, you all have seen uh, Michael Moore documentary. So Michael Moore enters in his story. So he appears, he makes the interviews, uh, he makes you log. Uh, but he is inside the, the documentary. He, um, he expresses his, his point of view. Uh, I prefer another type of documentary, so I prefer to stay outside 
and to, to give to let speech uh, let them, my character speech for me. So uh, surely I have an idea because when you narrate a story, you always have one point of view. Uh, it's not possible to think to be uh, neutral, so not to have um, your own point of view because if any of us has his point of view and. Uh, uh, this can be clear or this can be hidden in some ways. Uh, I prefer that second way, but uh, it's just a personal choice. So you have to, to make your own choice on your blog. Uh, if to, uh, you have to, to decide what, uh, what to tell. Uh, well, uh, the Italian, the 20th century Italian writer Carlo Emilio Gada once said that personal pronouns, apropos identity, were like the lice of writing. They're, they're, you're scratching them, you can't really get rid of them. And what's interesting to me about blogging and, and, and the subjective point of view in blogging today is that if you think about, again, in a historical perspective context, uh, in the 19th century people wrote adventure story, you know, uh, uh, Melville wrote a blog about sailing around the world. In, uh, and the adventure, because people couldn't do that experience, right? Then in the 20th century, uh, we have this crisis where we say we have to remove the author uh, from, you know, great writing is not about experience, it's about experimentation, okay? And that's the, the quote from Gada, you know, about the lice. I got some, in my, you know, I have a personal pronoun in my, in my hair. Then in the late 20th century, we have this other crisis where we say the author's dead and we realize that there's, apropos what uh, Paolo is just saying, there's actually no way to eliminate the I in, in writing. And then all of a sudden, with, the, with this explosion of the blogosphere, all of a sudden, we've kind of gone back to the 19th century where we want to travel with Paolo to uh, Piedmont or to Haiti and see, we want to see through your eyes because they're your eyes. And we want to go to Bon Convento and fall, we want to see, feel the terror of, 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 of about to fall, die in an olive grove, die happy in an olive grove. And so all of a sudden we've embraced a, a subjectivity again, and I think that's one of the most, I think that's something to be aware of as we, as we blog, because people, why do people, why do I, you know, whether you're reading Winks or, or Gregory's blog, I want to know Piedmont through Gre Gregory's eyes, I, I, or, uh, you know, I want to see, I, I want to go places I don't get to go, um, and I think that's why people read blogs today. It's an interesting shift. Just to add to that, um, I think um, uh, to Jeremy's point, good writing can have an I as a pronoun, mm -hmm. as long as it's not all about I, but I think wine, um, to some degree, there was, uh, especially in the last 10 to 20 years, there was a focus as if half a dozen critics and writers could tell you everything you needed to know, and it was, whether it was a score or a short review, and that was it. And, you know, your commentary is not, not as important because these big critics have it all figured out. And I think what has changed is wine is so subjective and beautiful and, and it's truly about experience. I, I have, the wine that changed my life was a Quinturelli Amarone that he doesn't even call Amarone because he was too proud to call it that. It matters to me. If you've never had the wine, you don't have that experience. And I think an effective way to share that, it's okay to have I in there because I think we're going back to that model that says that kind of experience is relevant and okay and we don't have to bow down to what just a few writers and critics have deem about a certain region, whether it's worthy or a certain wine is worthy or not. We're well past that, I think. Rosso del Beppe 99, that's exactly right. <laughs> so you know I, the wine. <laughs> I have one more question that any one of you feel free to answer, but I also want anybody out there, Robert has a microphone, so just raise your hand and he'll come to you. Um, and I brought this up, I think, with all of you, but we didn't really touch on it. My question is, what, is, uh, what defines a story from a, simply a report? Where, where's that line drawn? Um, because the story for me does have the beginning, middle, and end of some sort. And oftentimes you have people just, this is what happened. Is that a story? Well, I could certainly speak to that. My work um, as a journalist is somewhat unusual in that um, most often I'm asked to write personal essays and, and sought out for storytelling. And um, I would say from my experience, the difference between the work that I do and the work that my colleagues do 
um, not that they couldn't do the work that I do, it really depends on having an editor that's flexible and as people who have blogs, you know, uh, like I do, I started writing on a blog, um, that's how I, I started my career, you have the opportunity to publish whatever you want. Um, so if you have the opportunity first to publish what you want, then I think finding a story versus a report is about the details that you seek in the moment. So for me, when the press corps is, uh, you know, pressing up against the, the um, you know, the president or whatever, for me, I want to pull back. Um, I want to take a picture of the press corps. I want to know uh, what the people on the sidelines, how they're interpreting this moment. I want to know how the uh, community is affected. I've been speaking with a lot of you and some of the difficulty in photography and wine is that you're often asked to take pictures or inspired to take pictures of the same things over and over and um, you know wine bottles wine glasses and, and vines that's a hard way to tell a story because it's one that people already know it's one that you're tired of and so I would invite you if you want to tell a story versus file a report to really seek out something more unusual uh, within the space that you can, uh, what is special about the place where you are, because in that uh, specialness is usually uh, a more interesting way to, to move around the facts. I just had some, um, wanted to think. Um, I think that uh, any of us, so any of you has a, an interesting story. So uh, in theory, I could make a documentary about any of you. Uh, from my point of view, what makes the difference is when uh, this, is, this story uh, becomes the key to narrate something else, something bigger, so to narrate uh, a reality, for example. So if I make a story about uh, an Italian woman, an Italian man, it could be a way to narrate the transformation of the Italian reality. So uh, this is, for me, the key, uh, between, uh, the key point between an ordinary story uh, and a story that can tell something more, can, that can be universal, that can talk to any of us uh, and can uh, express other, other people behind a single story. That, for me, is the, the key point. Yeah. Uh, kind of expanding on that, uh, who remembers uh, Roland Barthes? Anybody? Got, got a couple of hands there. He wrote a really great book called Writing Degree Zero, right? where he said there's two, if you think of a scale of a spectrum of writing, it goes from zero to 180 degrees, where zero, let's just talk about wine writing, is, would be pure technical writing, like a fact sheet, right? And then one, on the 180 degrees side of that is this purely subjective language that's actually not intelligible. It's only intelligible. And I think that addressing your point about what's a story and, and bringing and having something emerge from it that's greater than the sum of just the parts is that great wine blogging on that, that spectrum falls somewhere, I hope it falls more towards the, the idiosyncratic is what, what uh, we would call what, what Bart called it. Uh, it's a balance of just, you know, uh, uh, the other day I read someone's blog who had just copied and pasted a fact sheet. Uh, it was a restaurateur. And I thought, you know, this is an example of no story. There's no story at all here. It's just, uh, you know, the wine was vinified in blah, 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 oak barrels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I think when wine blogging transcends the medium itself is when it's that balance between technical information and uh, uh, the personal, you know, a story, uh, 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 the subjective experience. And if I could, if I could just add to that, uh, one of the things that I love, and if you've watched uh, or if you've seen Emily's work online, she's talking about something I think is so important when it comes to looking for, uh, in a sense, looking for something that's outside of the obvious, but especially when it comes to wine, you get so tired of the same old thing, and that's part of what we're going to talk about all weekend when it comes to telling effective stories. Uh, I know that Wine Spectator, as an example, if you work in marketing, um, you know, you probably occasionally deal with publications. Wine Spectator now says, we need publicity photos of different regions, but they told the Finger Lakes, we don't want to see a single more, one, now one more photo of a winemaker holding a wine glass in a vineyard. Nobody does it. 
That's not realistic. That's, that's ridiculous, and yet everybody, that's the picture you always see. Now, I mean, I understand that, but they're looking, even line spectators are looking for something that's more realistic, not as cliche. And so even in a photograph, they're looking for something that tells a story in a little bit more unique fashion. And um, I, I think that's a worthwhile goal. I also think that as much as we will debate all weekend with the audience and with each other, the best ways to tell stories, it's inspiring to know there is no one formula. Some of the best writing never has I in it. Some of the best writing is about a personal travelogue. It's, it can be so many different things, and that's what should be fun this weekend. Exactly. So does anybody have any questions? I saw Robert. Yep, up here. Sort of to Jeremy's point about 100 and 180 degrees, I'm curious how you guys feel about hearing, getting feedback from people where they interpret your story and it's not the story you intended to tell and whether that's <laughs> you've achieved something positive, if, that's a, if you take that as a problem or is that part of what we're doing. It's not that important that we tell uh, that we tell a specific story, but it's more important that we we stimulate thought and discussion. It's a, it's a great point. It's a great question. I have one uh, for you. Uh, somebody uh, uh, translated uh, something that my wife Tracy said that I quoted on my blog. Uh, Tracy said that Gragnano was a wine for all things warm and gooey. And, uh, you know, for pizza, for melted mozzarella, the greatest wine to go with mozzarella, melted, you know, chewy mozzarella, warm and gooey. And there's not really a word in Italian for gooey. It's a tough word to translate. Uh, We've got to get Lizzie on that, right? And so a Neapolitan writer translated that, the wine for all things that are warm and sentimental. <laughs> <laughs> And all of a sudden, I had this flood of emails and comments saying, it's so true, I'm so sentimentally inspired by, <laughs> by this wine. And we were just talking about melted mozzarella. Uh, but I think that's the beauty of, of all of what we do is that, uh, like Umberto Eco said, it's the open work. And I love the immediacy. Uh, it's, it's prone to being misunderstood, but that's, that's the hypertext of what we and, do. And so is music. You're a musician. How often do you um, appreciate a song and you think, oh, this song speaks to me in this way, it, it, it speaks to my childhood. And then you, if you had a chance to talk to the songwriter, you might say, that's not what it's about at all. Uh, it's the same kind of thing with wine, but I think to, Greg makes a great point. Sometimes great writing will stimulate thought and stimulate discussion, and even if it's not perfectly accepted and, and taken that way, as long as it's not totally taken out of context. Now, I think... In, Trace's case, that's kind of borderline. I mean, it's sentimental. But I think uh, stimulating thought and discussion is what great writing does, um, and, and poor writing ra rarely does at all. And poor writing generally ends up ignoring. Here, here. Here, here. Yeah. Did you have a question? Anybody else have any questions? This is Joel here from My Mom and Song. Um, hi, Jeremy. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask a question because most of you guys are American. Um, do you think there is a difference between American blogging and um, European style? I think it's sometimes a choice of subject matter. Uh, Americans are heavily influenced by the Parkers, the Spectators, the grandiose, the, the exciting. Um, there can be more subtly occasionally here in Europe but you also see a merging of those two cultures a lot. Um, if anything, the Americans are more verbose, and I believe the Europeans tend to be more soft-spoken, unless you get into specific languages. Interesting characteristics as far as blogging go, uh, living in Spain, blog posts there can be very long and uninteresting. Um, sometimes the only part of the blog post that's interesting is the comments, because everybody's a commenter, and their comments usually are far larger than the actual blog post itself. And so it's an interesting dialogue that happens. Uh, the writing sometimes is reporting, but the dialogue that happens afterwards is the most interesting part. I don't know in Italian how that is. Or <laughs> um, and if you don't know Jules, she writes a fantastic blog called Wine, Woman, and Song. It's a great blog to check out. Uh, going, uh, you know, you, you do put your finger on it when you said it's, there's a continuity 
In, in other words, in, in the United States, and I'd love to talk about this tomorrow when we sit down and talk about the stories that haven't been told because this is really relevant. Uh, in America, we've tended to go down the park. You know, there's even bloggers that score wines. And, uh, uh, you know, we, that was the, and, and then of course in Italy, I mean, I don't know how many out, out there f follow Italian wine blogs. I do. I mean, I read Italian wine blogs every day. In Italy, it's very much followed the Italian, uh, you know, it can be sensationalist, but it's also, uh, uh, and we all, I don't need to name the person who I'm talking about, but we all know who I'm talking about. I mean, lawsuits come out of, of things that are written in secret code about the voting in Montalcino and, and this person, I mean, it's incredible. And it, there's definitely been a continuity where it's kind of followed the style of the Italian, very aggressive journalist, uh, uh, yellow journalism, uh, sensationalist. Uh, uh, um, and I definitely see a huge divide there that I think is our top, I, I, that's what I want to talk about tomorrow in our panel. I mean, overall, I would say, very generally speaking, <laughs> um, in the U.S., there, I feel like there's a little less storytelling sometimes and more emphasis on how important something was or is. Um, and maybe that's what prompted some of our ideas about trying to get the story, because I think people experience amazing things. I know they do. There's more and more press trips for bloggers and for uh, other non-traditional press. And these people are experiencing great things, but their leaders, the people they look to, we're just taking notes and writing them on paper and telling us how hot the vintage was. And hopefully by bringing in you know, people from other disciplines, we can look at new ways to create stories. So um, I want to thank you guys for, oh, we have one more Sorry, question. Sorry, I just want to pick up that point before I lost it, but it was related to it. One of the things we have, sorry, Rob McIntosh. Um, <laughs> we haven't talked about audience, really. There was a lot of storytelling. We haven't so much talked about the audience. But one of the key things is most of the time we write our blogs, write our blogs. We define whatever we think about our audience, but essentially they are also the people who speak the same language as I am writing in. And one of the things about the European Wine Bloggers Conference is we want to get over some of those things which are actually stopping us finding an audience, a broader audience, who are not limited by speaking the language that we speak. And until Google comes up with the best translation tool that actually gets the nuances of a story right, which is not going to happen, we're stuck. And I think I just wanted to say that maybe one of the things that is exciting about these new media is that they can now get beyond that limitation. And our stories about wine, our experiences, can now reach other cultures that we weren't reaching before. Well, that's I sort of half comment. Emily, <laughs> that seems to hit photography. Yeah, I was just going to say that I'm, I'm really thrilled to be leading a group of you tomorrow um, through, a, through town on a photo safari, and there are points that I will make to you uh, as, a, as a select group that I won't bother the audience with, but one of them is um, to encourage all of you to decide to be a photographer. And that's, of course, controversial. My photographer friends on, on Twitter would say, don't tell them that. Um, <laughs> you know, just because they have a cell phone doesn't mean they're a photographer. Um, but in fact, it does. Um, if you have a camera, you are a photographer. But I think there is a difference that um, within your mind that people need to make in order to really fully um, explore what photography can do in terms of reaching out to your audience. And, and part of really reaching that audience is making a commitment to reach them through photography, as opposed to seeing photography as a mere accessory to another story. And um, once you decide that, that, that you are in fact a photographer, in addition to the other things you may be, it allows you uh, a lot of power and freedom to, to move with your camera through the world in a different way and to start to see the story in that way um, as opposed to only seeing it as something that goes with the rest of the story. And the key point being that the photo doesn't need language to be understood. You know, that's what's so great about it. You can tell quite a story without any words. So um, I want to thank you all for being here and for talking. Uh, yeah.